I believe that it's providence that I'm here. And that he has a ministry and a work for me here. That he's going to use me in spite of myself. And he has a message that he wants to share with you this evening in the fifth gospel of the Bible. You all know where that is, right? The book of Revelation. And why do I call the book of Revelation the fifth gospel? Because Matthew, the first gospel, is all about Jesus. And Mark, the second gospel, is all about Jesus. And Luke, the third gospel, is all about Jesus. And John, the fourth gospel, is all about Jesus. And the last book of the Bible is called The Revelation of Jesus. That's why I call it the fifth gospel. But it's, it's for more reasons than that because technically the revelation of Jesus is telling us where the, the message came from, not who it's about, technically. I mean, if you're going to get technical about that. However, there is enough evidence in the book of Revelation to allow us the freedom to call this the fifth gospel. And we're going to look at some of that evidence this evening and as we continue on through this weekend. We want to begin, though, with a quiz. We know that the book of Revelation is symbolic. There are a lot of symbols in the book of Revelation, right? We know that there's the symbol of the beast, the symbol of the dragon, there's the symbol of horses. We know that there are all kinds of symbols there. What is, what one symbol in the book of Revelation tonight... And uh, the pastor's going to give the, the one who answers this a prize. I don't know what the prize is going to be yet because I haven't talked to him about it. But, but what is the one symbol in Revelation that is used the most? It is the most frequently used symbol in the book of Revelation. What is it? What is that? Someone said it. The lamb. That's right. That is... Oh, oh, oh. okay, now... We're going to add a question to that, and no one else can answer this but the one that cheated. How many times is that symbol used in the book of Revelation? That is for everyone. It's for everyone. Anyone know how many times that the symbol of the Lamb is used? 29 times. That's right. 29 times. Now, the beast is in second place. And I'm glad for that, aren't you? I mean that it's in second place. The beast, the symbol of a beast, at least a bad beast, is used 26 times in the book of Revelation. In other words, the focus of the book of Revelation is more on the lamb than it is on the beast. And that is really good news. Because sometimes when we open the book of Revelation or when we give a Revelation seminar, we do a Revelation prophecy, it's all about the beasts. Have you noticed that? The beast coming out of the sea and the beast coming out of the earth and, and the dragon attacking the woman. It's all about all these beasts and all these judgments and, and end time events and plagues. And I think in my mind, where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? You know, it takes 11 chapters. You have to move through 11 chapters. Revelation 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You have to move through 11 chapters to even encounter a beast. Hello? We don't even encounter a beast until we get to Revelation 11. The dragon isn't even until we get to Revelation 12. So what is the purpose of the first half of the book of Revelation? If it's not about beasts and it's not about dragons, then what is it about? That's what we want to discover. What is the first half of the book of Revelation all about? Now Martin Luther had an interesting take on the book of Revelation. He said, and I'm quoting in his preface, Preface to the German translation of Revelation, composed in 1522, Martin Luther said, the book of Revelation, he says, he did not consider this book to be prophetic or apostolic, since, he says, Christ is neither taught nor known in it. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that amazing? Now, Martin Luther had a problem not just with the book of Revelation, he also had a problem with the book of James. And a little bit with the book of Hebrews. So, you know, but I think it's interesting that in, in 1522, Martin Luther said, Christ is not known in the book of Revelation. Because we have already established that the Lamb in the book of Revelation is mentioned how many times? 29 times. How many times is the beast mentioned? 26. But I'm thankful because Martin Luther did a turnaround. In his 1530 preface, now this is just eight years later, 
in a completely new preface he composed in 1530, he reversed his position and he concluded that Christ was central. Are you getting this? Central. He concluded, as we see here in this book, that through and beyond the plagues, the beasts, the evil angels, that Christ is nonetheless with the saints and wins the final victory. What's that? Yeah, isn't that incredible? Think about this, because this is powerful. The first half of the book of Revelation introduces us to Jesus Christ. That's what the first half of the book of Revelation is for. That's why God waits until Revelation 11, 12, 13, and 14 until he introduces the beasts. Because in order for us to encounter the beasts, we need to know Jesus. We need to know the Lamb. We've got to know the Lamb. We have to have an encounter with the Lamb before we can encounter the beasts. Because our destiny, according to Revelation 22, is the new heaven and the new earth. That's, that's the destiny God has for us. But we can't get there by ourselves. God has to introduce us to His Son, and the love that He has for us, which is manifested through His Son, so that His Son can guide us past the beasts, and the dragon, and the plagues, and the false prophets. Are you following me? So that in Revelation 14, we are described as following the Lamb. What's the rest of the phrase? Wherever He goes. See, that's God's goal for us. To keep our eyes on Jesus. Now, it's easy to get our eyes off Jesus. It's easy to get our eyes distracted to the things of this earth to the problems and the concerns and the pains of life, to our faults and weaknesses and imperfections. It's easy to get distracted and get our focus off the Lamb. And you know what happens when we get our eyes off Jesus? We go down. We sink. But all we need to do is cry out, just like Peter did. Lord, save me, or I perish. Do you think you can save yourself? Now that you've been an Adventist for 27 years, James, do you think you can save yourself since you've been, you know, faithfully paying your tithe and eating your veggie dogs and drinking your soy milk? Do you think you can save yourself now? I knew I couldn't when I first came to Jesus, but now that I've been an Adventist for thus so many years, maybe now I'm in a better condition to save myself. What do you think? Am I a better person? Yeah, perhaps. Am I more saved than I was when I first came to Jesus? No. Because my entire righteousness, that is, my right standing before God, is found in Jesus. And always will be in Jesus. And sometimes he has to remind me of that by allowing me to fall on my face, to sink down into the water when I get a little, look at me guys, I'm walking on water. <laughs> Not like the rest of you, you see. But every time it's God's purpose to get our focus back on Jesus. And that's the message of the book of Revelation. Keep your focus on Christ. Let's take a closer look. This book is not about beasts and dragons and judgments. They're in there. They're in there. Because Jesus is wanting to save us from these images and what they really mean. There is an enemy out there that's seeking to get us. It's not even the revelation of St. John the Divine, as the front of my Bible says. No, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is all about Jesus and not just from Jesus. This is, in a sense, the summary of the entire Bible. In the book of Revelation, the entire Bible meets and ends. God has taken the message of the Word of God, the Bible, and He has summarized it in the book of Revelation. Every word, every phrase, every symbol means something. Something powerful, something huge. And God wants us to unpack it. He wants us to see what's there. What does he put in there for us? Well, there are some principles that can really help us to understand the book of Revelation and make it very simple and very powerful. This weekend, we're going to look, to look at some of those principles, and this weekend, we're going to look at a theme. Now, I want to give you a heads up. This weekend, we're not going to be focusing on the history of Revelation or the symbols of Revelation. We're not going to be focusing even on, on the present or future prophecies of Revelation. If you're here for a Revelation prophecy seminar, you, you're going to be a little bit disappointed. However... We are going to be focusing on something very powerful. We're going to be focusing on the gospel in Revelation. And if you have struggled to understand this book and how it reflects and reveals Jesus and the gospel, this is your time. 
This is your weekend. Because we're just going to flood our minds and hearts with this gospel message, this gospel truth. Notice this now. Revelation 1, verse 1. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must, what's the next word? Shortly come to pass. When was the book of Revelation written? Anyone know? A.D. 90, 95. Some say it was in 69 or so. There's those two opinions. But we know it was first century. We know that for sure. Things that must shortly come to pass. What is that telling us? That's telling us a little bit about the book of Revelation. That some of the book of Revelation actually applies to John's time. To things which must shortly come to pass. Now don't trip on that. Don't stumble on that. Because the book of Revelation is written not just for John's time, but also for our time. And for the time of believers between John's time and our time. All the way through. But it begins with John. We call this a revelation of prophecies that begins in John's day. We call this understanding historicism. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. The second principle we want to look at in Revelation 1 verse 11 is how God uh, wrote the book of Revelation. He says here that he sent and signified it. He signified. Does anyone know what that word means, signified? It means to give in sign language. I was teaching the uh, academy kids, that's high school age kids, in uh, Lorewood, which was an academy right there near Light Bears in Eugene, Oregon. They closed last year, and I don't know if you've heard about this, but Arise has merged with Light Bears, David Ashrick, Matt Parr, Jeffrey Rosario. They are all working with Light Bears now, and they have an Arise school that's working through the campus of Lorewood. It's a four-month training school, if you're interested. We're just closing it up. In fact, the students are bummed that I'm here this weekend because graduation is this weekend. And I, well, anyway, I apologize to them, but I can't apologize too much because here I am and it's a blessing to be here, right? So they, that, the Lorewood Academy, when it was running, I was teaching, I was teaching the seniors and I was teaching the sophomores, Life of Christ for the sophomores and Daniel and Revelation for the seniors. And I would come into class, you know, and in the morning the kids come in, you know, and they've got five minutes to get settled and sit down and be quiet. And, and you know, sometimes they're talking and they're interacting, especially on Monday mornings after the weekend. They're not used to the, the classroom etiquette that I have established. And that is, you know, once my time starts, your time ends. Once I start talking, you stop talking. And you need to stop talking before I start talking. And so at times, they'll be so enraptured with each other that they've forgotten that it's my time. And I'll just sit there for a few minutes and, and they'll look at me occasionally and I'll go like this. What does that mean? Cut it out. <laughs> right? That's, that's sign language, right? That's sign language, you see? I'm using symbols. <laughs> and that's how God has written the book of Revelation. He's used symbols, sign language. And so he wants us to go and find out what these symbols mean. For example, in the book of Revelation, he uses beasts. What do beasts represent? If I was to say to you today that uh, there is a, a, lion, a, a bear, if you think of a bear today, what would that represent to you, a bear? Russia, thinking of a country. Now, if I was to t- say a duck, what would you think of? Well, may- maybe you don't know the Oregon ducks. <laughs> Africa, yeah, the Oregon ducks, right? So, so God uses symbols, not just out of the blue, oh, I think I'll take these symbols and all. No, he uses symbols that he understands that we would be able to relate to. A bear represents the country of Russia. What about a dragon? What would that represent? China. What about a lion? England. What about an eagle? United States. Okay, so we use these animals to symbolize countries or powers or nations. God does the same thing in the Bible. When we talk about a beast, we're talking about a a power, a kingdom, a a nation, a country on this earth. And so once we have the symbol, then we need to just identify from the characteristics of that beast, who is this power? Who is this nation? Who is this kingdom? All the way through the Bible, excuse me, through the book of Revelation, we have these symbols. And the Bible identifies what these symbols mean, and then we apply those identifications to specific Things that have happened in history or are happening or are going to happen. We'll take a closer look at that later. So, prophecies of Revelation are written in symbolic language. But symbols can be understood. 
Next principle. This is so powerful. Revelation 1 verse 3. Blessed is he who what? Reads and those who hear, keep and those who hear. So what we have here is we have how many blessings on the book of Revelation? One, two, three. Why would God put three blessings on the book of Revelation? I like that one. For the, I've never heard that before. One for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost. I like that. For sure, though, he wants us not to be afraid of this book. You see? Now, it's exactly the opposite today. Wherever I travel, wherever I go, people are afraid of Revelation. I was in Pakistan. I was doing Revelation seminars in Pakistan. They had me go back there three years in a row. You know why? I remember I was in Karachi. I was doing a seminar, and I had a translator. And you know what he said to me? He said, when I started studying the book of Revelation, my father, who was an elder in the church, and the pastor came to me, and this is what they said. They said, don't study the book of Revelation. If you study the book of Revelation, scary beasts will come to take you at night. I said, you've got to be joking me. No. We Christians are afraid of the book of Revelation. How many Christians dutifully read through the Bible? Because we know we're supposed to. We might skip over numbers, you know. And we go through the Bible dutifully. We read every book. We read. Then we get to Revelation. We're like, <clears throat> I think I'll start all over again. There are so many who refuse to read the book of Revelation because it's scary. My wife was raised in a Christian home. She traces, as a young person, her first nightmares to attending a Revelation seminar. It was after that Revelation seminar she started having these nightmares. The book of Revelation is a scary... Who wants to be let down among beasts and dragons and judgments and plagues and eerie horsemen? See, the symbols at the same time, I remember, before I was ever a Christian, before I ever knew anything about the Bible, ooh, the book of Revelation was intriguing. I was curious about it. 666, what is that all about? i got to find out. You know, I would open it up and I would begin to read it. I couldn't figure out anything about it. I thought, this is crazy stuff, but I was still curious. And that's one of the reasons. I was in the, seniors, the senior class on Revelation. It was really funny. I said, I said, seniors, I said, think about this. Think about this. I said, today, probably the most captivating uh, uh, principle, I mean, the, the most captivating power influence in the world today is the media. Movies. I said, now I want you to think about this. What kind of movies do you like? Oh, I like adventure. Oh, I like horror movies. Oh, I like drama. Oh, I like romance. Every single category of movie can be found in the book of Revelation. You want romance? It's in the book of Revelation. The bride and the husband. You want horror? It's in the book of Revelation. You want adventure? It's in the book of Revelation. You want drama? It's in Revelation. You want sci-fi? Four beasts with angels all over, with eyes all over the... It's in the book of Revelation. Everything's in the book of Revelation. God has taken this book so that we can reach out to the needs of the world today that are being inundated with the influence of the media. It's all in the book of Revelation. And it's drawing us to understand it. God wants to bless us in that understanding. So, the prophecies of Revelation contain a threefold blessing, encouraging us. The word blessed means happy. Not filled with nightmares and scared, but happy. God wants to make us happy. Why? Well, the book of Revelation not only talks about the events in John's time, but also talks about future events. The book of Revelation shows us what's ahead. In symbolic language, it shows us what's ahead. I started this thing in my home some years ago when my kids were smaller, and they follow through with it really well. I would be walking through the home, minding my own business, and out of nowhere, my son would go, boo! Oh, I would jump. Gotcha, Daddy. He would smile. He just thought it was so funny. I remember one day I came home. I walked through the garage, opened the door into the laundry room. Right beyond the laundry room is the kitchen. It was lunchtime, but there was nobody there. Hmm. I backed up a little bit and did my fake steps, you know? Out of the pantry jumped my wife. Boo! I said, boo to you too. <laughs> I didn't scare you. I knew you were there. I knew that something was going on because I knew you guys were too quiet around lunchtime. The book of Revelation is not given to scare us. It's given to prepare us. It's to prepare us by showing us what's hiding around the corner so that when it jumps out, it will not catch us by surprise. That 
we will be kept in the hour of temptation. That's exactly what Jesus says. Not to scare us, but to prepare us. Now, what is the first message of the book of Revelation? What is the first thing God wants us to know? First things first. A lot of us like to jump into Revelation 13. You know, we want to know about the beast. We want to know about the mark. You know, we want to know about how that's going to be enforced. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Revelation chapter 1 is where we start. Not Revelation 13. There's something we need to know before we get to Revelation 13. And what is that? It is the message of God's love. Unto him who loved us and has freed us from our sins by his own blood. Why is that so important? Because when you know the love of Jesus as your own, there's nothing in this world that can scare you. He has released us. He has released those who were all their lifetime subject to death because they were afraid. You see, afraid. He wants to take away that fear by filling us with his love. And perfect love casts out all fear. Are the things you're afraid of tonight? Are you concerned? Are you worried? Are you anxious? Are you troubled? Are you carrying the burden of fear somewhere in your heart, somewhere on your shoulders? Allow more of the love of God to saturate your heart and soul and to free you from that, from that fear, from that guilt. When we are filled to the full with the love of God, fear has no place in our hearts. And so God wants to fill us first with his love. This is the first message of the book of Revelation. I've loved you and I've washed you from your sins by my blood. There is nothing that you can do to change my love for you. Now, some of us think, well, God loves us because. God loves us because Jesus died for us. Uh Uh-uh. God does not love us because Jesus died for us. God loved us before Jesus died for us. That's why God sent Jesus to die for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He doesn't love us because Jesus didn't have to die and say, okay, now that I died, please love them. (laughs) No, no, no. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen who? The Father. The Father himself loves you. That's why I'm here. I'm here to show you that God loves you. Believe it. God is in love with us. He loves us more than life itself. So the prophecies of Revelation first reveal God's love for us. Have to do that. Have to do that. Because otherwise you're going to be scared to death. Our natural inclination is to be filled with fear. Even fear of God. And sometimes we hide from God in church. God wants to fill us with his love to take away that fear. First vision of Revelation. What is the first thing John sees? Is it a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns? A beast ascending up out of the sea, out of the bottomless pits? A land beast on the earth? Seven last plagues? What is it that he sees before he sees anything else? Revelation chapter 1, beginning with verse 12 and 13. I saw seven candlesticks, and in the midst of the candlesticks, who did he see? The Son of Man. That's Jesus. That's another name for Jesus. John sees Jesus first. So the first thing he hears is God's love. The first thing he sees is Jesus. Are are you getting this? This is really important because the book of Revelation is an outline of salvation. When you get up in the morning, the first thing you need to know is that God loves you. You don't need to be telling him what you're going to do for him. He wants to tell you what he's going to do for you. I love you. (laughs) Good morning. Say, well, I don't hear God tell me in the morning when I wake up that he loves me. When you wake up in the morning, take a breath. You know what that's saying? I love you. (laughs) Just read Acts chapter 17. God is not far from every one of us. In him we live and we move and we have our being. When we wake up in the morning, that's an evidence that God loves us. I love you. That's the first thing God wants us to know. He loves us. And then he wants us to see him, to see him in his word, to see him in action in in every aspect of our lives. He wants us to know that he's with us and that he hasn't forsaken us. And that's why he gives John this vision of him standing among these candlesticks. Because the first thing that we see is ourselves. So the prophecies of Revelation first reveal Jesus to us. Why? Because these seven candlesticks, according to Revelation chapter 1, represent what? Seven churches. The seven churches. And those seven churches have some problems. I'm not sure if you recognize this, but we are not perfect. So you look at these churches and you realize, church number one, Ephesus, I have a few things against you. Sardis, excuse me, not Sardis, Smyrna, I have a few things against you. 
and Tyre, Tyre, I have these things against you. And I haven't found your works perfect. And uh, Laodicea, you make me want to throw up. <laughs> now, I think this is really powerful because when we wake up in the morning, we are aware, most of us, if we're in tune with the fact that we are imperfect. We know we failed our husbands or our wives or our children or our neighbors or our work mates or our church family or whoever it is that's in the vicinity of where we move and live and have our being. We are aware of our imperfections in thought as well as action. And so God gives us this vision of these seven churches that are filled with imperfections. Now I only listed five here. Anyone know why? Okay, because there's two churches here that are missing and why are they missing? I said Smyrna, but I shouldn't have said that because Smyrna's not on the list. Why are the two churches missing? Who are the two churches? Smyrna and Philadelphia. Why aren't they here? I said the title of this is We Are Not Perfect. Smyrna and Philadelphia have no what? No problem, no criticism, nothing. There's nothing. They're like doing good. You ever meet someone like that? Me neither. So, <laughs> so you have these two churches, and then you have this vision. Now I want you to look at this vision again with me. Take a close look at it. Here it is. You see it there? It's Jesus. Where is he standing? He's standing among how many churches in this vision? Two. Is that the vision that we got? No. But that's the vision many times that we get. <laughs> Isn't it? When we go to church, or even in our own mind and heart, we think God's with the perfect. God's with the righteous. God's with those who are doing good. He's not with me. That's for sure. You see the point? The first vision of Revelation is a vision of God's unconditional love. He doesn't pull away from all of the churches that are imperfect and hang out with the churches that are perfect and say, hey, when you guys get your act together, you can come and join us. Because if that was the case, we would never go to join us. <laughs> We'd be without hope. So the first vision that God gives to John is the vision of Jesus among all seven of the churches. And of course, he wants us to replicate that in our own lives. Because there's always someone that we're probably feeling a little bit superior to or better than or whatever, when really we're not. And so God has given us this vision for ourselves. Be of good cheer. I'm with you. I won't forsake you. And then I want you to replicate that. I want you to be with others. And then with others and then with others. So they can know, so they can feel, so they can sense, so they can realize, so they can experience my unconditional love. So this is the first message. This is the first vision. And this is how God acts it out in symbols. Now, there's a lot of history to the churches. We're not covering all that history. We're looking at the big picture here. We're focusing on the gospel and the message of the gospel. You remember when Jesus was going to the cross? He told his disciples, tonight, all of you are going to forsake me. By the way, what did Peter say when he said that? Not me. What made him say that? Not me, Lord. Not me. Why do you believe it? He, he actually, in his mind and heart, he actually actually say this. I get up earlier than James and John. I study more than Peter, or excuse me, more than Andrew. And, and I'm much more faithful than Judas and all the others. In other words, the only way he could say, see, he was actually telling Jesus, you're right about them, but you're wrong about me. Isn't that amazing? Don't you think that's incredible? I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if in this day and age, there were people who did the same thing? Like, like they would say, I can see how that could apply to the Baptists and the Catholics and the Methodists, but I'm an Adventist. I'd never forsake the Lord. Wouldn't that be amazing? What do you think? Is it possible that we're repeating the history of Peter in the way we relate to our fellow disciples? By the way, just for clarification, the majority of God's people are in these other churches. You see? So we need to have an attitude of humility. 
in the way that we relate to other people. Because but for the grace of God, we're going to fall flat on our face just like Peter did. We've got to be aware of our own weaknesses. Peter wasn't willing to acknowledge that. If he would have been willing to acknowledge that, he would have been okay. He went through a terrible trial because of it. But praise God, Jesus was there. You know why? Jesus said, you're all going to forsake me. I'm going to Jerusalem. You're all going to forsake me. But, he says, when I am risen, I will go before you unto Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing? What is he actually assuring them of there? He's telling them, even though you forsake me, I'm not going to forsake you. Even though you leave me, I'm not going to leave you. This is the message that God is giving us in the, in the vision of the seven churches. He's with us. In spite of, so be of good courage. Be of good courage. Jesus is there for us. The Laodicean church is so lukewarm that it makes him want to throw up. But he loves us. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. I used to think there was nothing positive about the Laodicean church, but, but Jesus has a positive message there. I love you. I love you. And that love is what motivates and changes the heart. So, the prophecies of Revelation focus on the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the intercession of Jesus. Now, this is really powerful. I want you to think about this for just a second. I'm not going to enlarge upon this tonight, but we are going to look at it as we move through the series this weekend, tomorrow specifically. The prophecies of Revelation focus on the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the intercession of Jesus. And by the way, just moving forward, one more step here. 1 Corinthians 15, that says 5, but it's at, oh, that's right. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, tell us that the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of the gospel. This is the foundation. You can't get any more gospel than the incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus. Now going back to the slide, look at this with me. This is really powerful. In the seven churches, we have a picture of of the incarnation of Jesus. He's with us. He's with his people. Okay? In the seven seals, we have a picture of the crucifixion of Jesus. In Revelation chapter 5, John looks and he sees a lamb in the midst of the throne as it had been slain. Now, in the seven trumpets, we have a picture of the intercession of Jesus. John, in the seven trumpets, sees an angel at the altar with incense, and he's adding the incense to the prayers of the saints that are coming up before God out of the angel's hands. That's the intercession of Jesus. So the book of Revelation, in an overview, gives us a picture of the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the intercession of Jesus, the gospel. See, I was trying to tell you earlier, it's not just because it says this is the revelation of Jesus that it's the fifth gospel. The very contents of this book continually points to Jesus. God does not take us anywhere. It doesn't take us to the history of the churches, the history of the seals, or the history of the trumpets until he takes us to Jesus. He takes us to Jesus' incarnation, then he takes us to his crucifixion, then he tells us the seals, then he takes us to intercession, then he tells us about the trumpets. And that's the way the book is laid out. It's so powerful. It's, it's amazing when you think about it, that this book is so gospel-saturated that if it was the only book you had... It would be enough. It would be enough. It would tell us that we are to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Okay, so now look at this. This is John 1, 4, and I want us to, to try and understand. This is going to be a little bit challenging for us, but I think we're going to get it. It's, it's very powerful. John chapter 1, verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace unto you and peace from Him which is, and from Him which was, and from Him which is to come. What tenses are there in this verse? What tenses? Present, past, and future. Okay, so I'll just say that in order. Past, present, and future. Who's it talking about? Talking about God, right? Jesus. Jesus is with us. Past tense, present tense, and future tense. Now, this is who God is. He's the God of Abraham, and he's the God of Jacob, and he's the God of Isaac. And by the way, he's the God of the living and not the dead. Okay? God sees things as though they are. They may not actually be happening now, but he sees things as though they are. So he's the God of the past. He's the God of the present. Is God present with us now? And we can be assured that he will be with us in the future. This is the basic way the book of Revelation is written. Now look at this. This is really powerful. 
Prophecies of Revelation reveal God as He is with us in the past, in the present, and in the future. Now look at verse 19 of Revelation chapter 1. John is told, Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which what? Shall be hereafter. Do you see that? God was, is, and shall be. And he wants John to write the things which he has seen, which are happening, and which will be in the future. That is the key to understanding the book of Revelation. If you miss this, you'll go anywhere and everywhere in the book of Revelation. But if you will just get this one principle, you've got the key that will unlock the book of Revelation. It will be a steady anchor as you move through these prophecies and seek to understand this book. Let me break it down in a, in, a, in a simpler way. The prophecies of Revelation focus on history past, history present, and history future. Because God is with us past, present, and future. We understand this to be historicism. The historicist approach to the book of Revelation. The historicist approach. Now, don't misunderstand that word. Sometimes people look at that word and they say historicism, historicist. That means everything's in the past. No. His, history is not just past, you see? History is past, history is happening, and history is going to continue to happen. Historicism says that it spans the time from the first century A.D., and there's a little of an exception to that, and we'll look at that perhaps if we have time, down to the second coming of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation starts in John's time past, takes us all the way through the centuries to the present and into the future till the second coming of Jesus, and beyond that, just a little bit, to the second coming of Jesus, and then to the setting up of the new heavens and the new earth. This is historicism. Now, there are other ways to interpret the Bible. And I think we need to be aware of those ways because they're very popular in the world today. The one that we want to look at right now is preterism, the preterist view of interpreting Revelation. Preterism says that the prophecies were fulfilled in the past. Nero was the Antichrist and, and all those prophecies in the book of Revelation were all fulfilled in the first century. That's pre- it's all in the past. Okay. Then there is futurism. Futurism basically says that the majority of these prophecies from about chapter 4 and onward are all in the future. They haven't happened yet. All of this stuff is in the future. So preterism says it's all in the past. Futurism says pretty much in the future. Okay? And there's one more that is significant today, and that is idealism. The idealist approach says that the book of Revelation expresses eternal spiritual truths that, that express themselves in history. And we'll look at that a little bit tomorrow because... I want to suggest to you tonight that preterism and futurism and idealism are all true in the context of historicism. In other words, there's nothing wrong with preterism or futurism or idealism as long as they're in the context of historicism. The danger is when we take them out of that context and we make all of Revelation future or all of Revelation past or all of Revelation idealism. It's like separating the whole kernel from the grain, you know, white bread. You take it, uh, I used to do this when I was a kid, I love white bread, I can't stand it now but I loved it then. I take a, uh, a piece of white bread, I peel off the crust, I roll it up in a little ball, you know, and I just chuck it in my mouth, <laughs> down it goes. There's no nutritional value. I mean, I know they try to put the stuff back in, etc. But we want the whole grain. We want all the nutrients. We want everything. Let's not separate. Keep it all together. That's what God is telling us in the book of Revelation. Keep it all together. Historicism, the historicist approach, has prophecy that's in the past. That's preterism. Has prophecies in the future. That's futurism. And they see idealism as applicable in certain aspects of prophecy. Historicism takes in the whole kernel. Everything's there. In, in the historicist position. But more importantly, that's the way God wrote the book of Revelation. He says, I'm going to show you, I want you to write things that are, that have been, that are, and that will be. That's the way it was written. And if we'll take that approach, the book of Revelation will just open to our minds and hearts. We're going to see things there that we have never seen before. Now, there's one other principle that we're going to be looking at that's really powerful, and it will really help those of you who are familiar with the sanctuary, to know where we are as we travel through the book of Revelation, and that is the symbolism of the sanctuary. You know there are almost 70 references to the symbols of the sanctuary in the book of Revelation, and the Lamb is one of the most used. 
the candlesticks, the lamb, the altar, the golden censer, the golden altar, the incense, the Ark of the Testament, all of these are taken or borrowed from the sanctuary. Why did God do that? Well, because the book of Revelation is the gospel, because it's the, the plan of salvation, because it's talking about Jesus, and because that's what God did with the sanctuary. The sanctuary was all about the plan of salvation. That's what it was about. The sanctuary was built to outline how salvation works. It was wrapped by a wall of white linen, nine feet tall. In order to get into the sanctuary, which, by the way, is where God wanted us, because that's where he dwells, and he wants to be at one with us. He wants to be reunited with us. But in order to get into the sanctuary, you had to go around that wall. You couldn't go over it. You couldn't go through it. That white linen wall, nine feet tall, represents the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The only way was through the gate. And in order to get through the gate, you had to have a lamb. Only the lamb could get you into the courtyard. Only Jesus can get you in, reconciled back to God. So the whole sanctuary was an outline of the plan of salvation. There were three basic aspects to the sanctuary. There was the courtyard, there was the holy place, and there was the most holy place. And by the way, that's our destiny. God wants us to the most holy place. That's where he is. That's where he wants us to be. And so God says that, that his way was in the sanctuary. And Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It was an outline of him. Jesus was the lamb. Jesus was the priest. Jesus was represented by the light. I'm the light of the world, the lampstands. He was the bread of life, the showbread, the incense. All of the, the, the imagery of the sanctuary represented Jesus. It all pointed to Jesus. And it pointed to the plan of salvation and what he wanted to be for us and give to us and do for us. So all of the imagery there is significant because of this. Now when you look at the sanctuary imagery, you see all of these symbols all representing something. For example, the gate is when we come into the courtyard, we come into the place where we see Jesus Christ on the cross, the lamb was, was offered on that altar of offering, and we accept him as our savior. The laver, just before you went into the holy place, was where the water was, that represents baptism. Going to the holy place, you had the table of showbread. Anyone remember how many stacks of bread were on each side? There were two stacks of bread. How many were on each side? Six. Six and six. How many books are there in the Bible? Sixty-six. It represented the Word of God, studying the Word of God. Then you have the altar of incense, represents prayer. Then you have the candlestick, which represents light or witnessing. So we come to Jesus, we accept Him as our Savior, we're washed, our sins, we're cleansed, we're baptized. We come into the holy place, we study the Word of God, we pray, and we witness. We don't try to witness, we witness. Jesus said, let your light shine, let it shine. You spend time in my Word, okay? You spend time watching football, what are you going to talk about? Football, okay? You spend time on cars, what are you going to talk about? Cars. You spend time in the Bible, what are you going to talk about? Jesus. It's just the way it is. What you put in is going to come out, okay? So let your light shine. So he says, spend time in the Word, spend time in prayer. And poof. You know, when you've been praying for someone, it shows. Are there people missing in the church? People aren't attending? You're worried about them? Pray for them. Don't talk about them. Pray for them. Then when you see them, you're not going to say, hey, you haven't been here in a long time. Which actually scares them back out the door. <laughs> you know? There's pe there are people today, there are people tonight who are not coming to this church because when they come, someone's going to say to them, haven't seen you in a long time. What do you think? But if you start praying for people, go through your, your member list. Anyone that's missing, start praying for them. We've done this in several churches. It's powerful. So you start praying for those people. Next time you see them, you're going to say, good to see you. We've been praying for you. How are you doing? Anything we can pray for specifically. It changes you. You have a completely different attitude about people you pray for. By the way, I was prayed into this church. I was prayed into Christianity. I shouldn't say into this church, but I was out there in the world, and there were people praying for me, and God started working in a powerful way, and that's how I gave my life to Jesus. Because people were praying for me. Prayer is powerful. It's not the last resort. It's the first and the only resort. Prayer is powerful. That's why it's in the holy place and it's also in the most holy place. The censor goes into the most holy place. So all of these are symbols of our Christian experience. Justification takes place in the courtyard. Sanctification in the holy place. Glorification in the most holy place. Now, finally, one last principle. We've got six minutes and 45 seconds left. And that is the principle of repeat and enlarge. I'm not 
trying to explain this. I hope it's going to make sense. I think it will. Every one of the visions in Revelation begins at John's time and takes us all the way to the second coming of Christ. Then he goes back and he starts all over again. And he fills in more detail, second coming of Jesus. That's why in Revelation, you have Jesus returning in Revelation chapter uh, 1. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me. Behold, he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him, them that pierced him. Um, the great day has come. The third world is coming quickly. I'm coming quickly. Over and over again in the book of Revelation, it ends with the second coming of Jesus. It goes back, ends with the second coming of Jesus. It goes back, ends with the second coming of Jesus. Because Jesus is coming again. Why? Why is he coming? Revelation 14, he told us. Excuse me, John 14, he told us. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are... Which tells us how many people are going to be saved, right? A lot. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. I'm not lying to you. There's a place for you. I've gone to prepare a place for you. And if I've gone all the way to heaven to prepare a place for you, guess what? I'm coming back. What for? So that you can be where I am. Okay? That's why he's coming. I'm so scared. At the second coming of Jesus. Why? He's gone to prepare a place for you. He's coming back for you. Lift up your heads. Rejoice. God wants us to be there. He wants us to be there. And so he wants to make sure we know how to get there. He wants to make sure we're on the path. He wants to make sure. So he's giving us directions, directions to heaven. And it's a principle that we find all through the scriptures. It's called the principle of repeat and enlarge. I'm going to try and illustrate this by giving you directions to Light Bear's ministry. If you were to come to Light Bearers Ministry for our camp meeting, let's say. We have a camp meeting every year at Light Bearers. We, last year, I think we had our 26th annual camp meeting, and we call it a convocation. You're welcome to come. Uh, it's going to be July 3rd through 8th, I think it is. First weekend in July, starting on Tuesday night. So please, make plans to, to get there. If you were to come and you were driving, uh, I'm going to say if you were driving from the north, but you're driving from the south, so you would go Roseburg, past Roseburg, I-5 south, going north to Portland, towards Portland, you would take the Springfield exit, Highway 126. Then you would see this Main Street light, and you would see a little sign saying Jasper Pleasant Hill. You just go straight through, just follow that light, go straight through, and as you drive about eight miles, you're going to see a sign on the left that says Light Bears, 37457, Jasper Lower Road. Think you can make it? I don't. So I'm going to give you some, some details in the direction. Because I want to make sure that you not only make it, but you make it there safely, okay? First of all, when you get off the I-5, which is 60 to 65 miles an hour, you're going to get into a 55-mile-an-hour zone. Look out, John says, for the beast. Slow down, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and then the expressway is going to end, and you're going to come into a 45-mile-an-hour zone. And if that's not bad enough, you're going to come into a 35-mile-an-hour zone. And there's a police officer that likes to park right inside someone's driveway. So you cannot see him. And he will pull you over if you're going 39. <laughs> he wants to give you a ticket, especially if you're an out-of-towner. So I'm warning you about the beast. I'm warning you about the dragon. Are you following me? Look out. Okay, look out. Then you'll see a sign, school ahead, crossing ahead, basically. And then you'll see our sign, 37457 uh, uh, Jasper Lowell Road. You'll also see a little bookstore sign out there. Got it? Think you're going to make it? I don't. So I'm going to repeat this again. I'm going to give you some more details just to make sure. You're going to see some big stacks there as you're coming down the 126. That way you're going to know you're going in the right direction. Uh, you're going to see the lights there, the, the stop lights. Be sure and stop if it's red. And then you're going to see a green bridge on the right. You're going to see the Jasper store on the left. Go past the Jasper store on the left, past the green bridge on the right. And don't buy gas at the Jasper store, because right now it's three sixty nine a gallon. And then you're going to see two metal buildings. They're brown. That first building is our office. The second building is our publishing house. Think you can make it? I think you're going to get pretty close. I think you're going to do it. But, just in case, you're also going to cross some railroad tracks. You cross the railroad tracks as long as the beams are up and the lights aren't flashing red. Right? You with me? You'll see mile markers, mile marker one. You'll see the Willamette River to your right. You'll go a little further and you'll see mile marker two. And you go too far and you're going to get to mile marker three. If you get to mile marker three, you've gone 
too far. Back up, turn around, and go back. Because light barriers is between two and three. And there is our parking lot. Think you can make it? I do. <laughs> I hope so. This is how the book of Revelation is written. God repeats and enlarges. He tells us about beasts. He tells us about following the Lamb. He tells us about the history of the church. He tells us what to expect, what's happened, what's going to happen. So when you drive down the road and say, I'm not sure if I'm going the right Well, we passed that sign. We passed that sign. There's the Green Bridge. There's the Jasper store. It must be up ahead. There's more markets. We've gone too far. Let's turn around and go back. That's the way the book of Revelation is written. And you parallel all of those visions and you get a powerful revelation of history past, history present, and what's to come. Powerful stuff. This is the way the Bible is written. It's really powerful when you think about it, this repeat and enlarged principle. Let's look at it quickly. Genesis chapter 1 is the creation story. Guess what Genesis 2 does? Repeats and enlarges. If we didn't have Genesis 2, we wouldn't have known that Adam or that uh, Eve was created from the rib. More details on the creation story. This is how I actually did it. You see? Then you go into Exodus, repeated and enlarged upon Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy repeats the Ten Commandment law that was given in Exodus. Repeat and enlarge. Then you get First and Second Samuel, and then you have First and Second Kings, and then you have First and Second Chronicles. You know, if you don't read it in First and Second Samuel, you can read about it in the Chronicles of the Kings. You can read about it in the Chronicles. Then you have Daniel two, Daniel seven, Daniel eight, Daniel eleven. Repeat and enlarge. God is all the while seeking to get us to heaven. That's His goal. So He's giving us more and more information. You see this also in the New Testament. Matthew, repeat and enlarge. Mark, repeat and enlarge. Luke, repeat and enlarge. John. Now we know Mark was written first. It was the smaller gospel, and everyone supposedly borrowed from that. So it's not necessarily in order, but you get the picture. There are truths in those Gospels that may not be in other Gospels. You know a story, you know a verse, you know uh, a something there that is special to you that is only maybe perhaps in one of the Gospels, not in all of the Gospels. God puts more information specifically calculated to reach a certain heart or a, uh, to reach a certain experience that we're going through at a certain time. Repeat and enlarge. And that's the way we see the book of Revelation. The seven churches, repeat and enlarge in the seven seals repeat and enlarge in the seven trumpets all calculated to get us to heaven that's the goal god is giving us directions to heaven repeating and enlarging upon them showing us what to look out for showing us the right way showing us the signs that we need to to look for so that we know we're on the path and and so that we can be sure we get to the destination and the destination is heaven the reason why this is so important is because many times we can get confused for example manasseh was a wicked king. He was, the, he was so wicked, he was worse than Ahab, he was so wicked that he spilt more blood in Israel than any of the previous kings that had been before him. Manasseh finally, God took care of him. He said, you know, I'm taking you out. I'm taking you into Babylon. You're done. It's over. Took him captive to Babylon. He's there in prison in Babylon. And then it says here in the context of this specific verse, it says, now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did and all his sins which he sinned, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? And Manasseh slept with his fathers and was buried. That's 2 Kings chapter 21, verses 9, 11, 16 through 18. If we didn't have Chronicles, if we just had 2 Kings, we would conclude that Manasseh was a lost man. Was Manasseh a lost man? How do you know that? Because we got the rest of the story. The rest of the story is in 2 Chronicles. And this is really powerful. When we think about it, this is really powerful. In 2 Chronicles, it says, The Lord spoke to Manasseh, to his people, but they would not hearken. The Lord brought upon them, upon them the captains of the hosts of the kings of Assyria, which took Manasseh, carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, what did he do? What happens when you're in affliction? See, he sought the Lord. Sometimes you go, why is God letting this happen to me? La, 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 la. God allows things to happen to us at times so that we can seek him more earnestly. Sometimes I feel safer in affliction than I do in prosperity because it causes me to seek to, to cling to the Lord as never before. And when he was in his affliction, he besought the Lord his God and he humbled himself greatly before the Lord God of his fathers. He prayed to him. He was entreated of him. He heard his supplication. He brought him again to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. And then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. So God gives us this repeat and large understanding of the Word of God, understanding of prophecy, not just to make sure that we've got the journey down, but also to give us hope. Because sometimes when it ends right here, we think, ah, it's over. No, it's not over. Read Revelation 21 and Revelation 22. There's not going to be any more crying, any more pain, any more sorrow. That's the world that God created. God never designed that we would experience any evil. This world is not His plan. That's why Jesus said, 
when you pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. See, that's what we're praying for. Why? Because it's not being done right now. If God's will was being done on earth as it is in heaven, we wouldn't need to pray that. Deliver us from evil, Jesus says. You need to pray. Deliver us from evil. Why? Because there's evil on this planet. Some people say, well, everything that happens is God's will. Oh, really? So we're praying to God to be delivered from God? No, I don't think so. Jesus wouldn't say, pray, be delivered from evil, if everything that happened, including evil, was God's will. Then we'd be praying to be delivered from God's will. No, there's a conflict taking place. There's a battle taking place. Revelation chapter 12 brings this out so powerfully. There are things happening on this planet that are not God's will. And Jesus says, pray that you'll be delivered from them. And you will. That prayer will always be answered. Sometimes in God's way, in God's time. But will always be answered. Ultimately, God is going to deliver us from evil. He's going to deliver every human being who prays that prayer in sincerity to Him. He's going to deliver every human being from evil. That's his ultimate plan for all of us. And we are going to look back when we are one billion years old, one trillion years old, one decillion years old. We're going to look back at this little speck, this little vapor of a life. That's what James 4 says. Our life is like a vapor. It appears for a little while and then it vanishes. And we're going to think back. You know, there's things in my 49 years and six months of life that I can't remember. Have you noticed that? And I'm only 49! What's going to happen when I'm a decillion and 49 years old? Do you think I'm going to remember this world? It's going to be like gone. That's why the Bible says they will not come to remembrance. Who can remember a decillion years ago? What happened in a vapor of a life a decillion years ago? That is what God is going to do. He's going to take it out, completely out. But just in case we're prone to forget completely, there's going to be the scars. In his hands. The only reminder of our choice, of our decision to turn away from God, is going to be in his own hands. And when we see those hands, we will ever be grateful, ever be grateful for the love that God has bestowed upon us. Amen? Let's pray together tonight. Father in heaven, we are thankful even now for the revelation of Jesus, that you've loved us, past tense, that you've washed us, past tense, freed us from our sins by your blood, that you're with us among the churches in spite of our imperfections, our faults, our defects, that you long for us to recognize that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Father, tonight we have our issues, we have our concerns, we have our burdens, We enter into this place, into this moment, into this time, into this prayer and ask that you'll take them from us. We would give them to you, but our hands are heavy and our hearts are overwhelmed. And so we're asking that you will take them from us, that you will relieve us of them, that you will give us your peace and your rest on this Sabbath. Don't allow us to go our own way, don't allow us to think our own thoughts, but Keep our focus on Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen.